All right, welcome to our closing plenary. We are uh, going to wrap up this conference uh, with a really stellar panel of cultural, of culture makers, artists, and cultural critics and activists. Uh, I'm going to introduce each of them briefly and we're going to watch a clip of their work because uh, I want you all to know the context uh, in which you're going to be listening to them, uh, the context of their work. So we are going to start right here with Jose Antonio Vargas. Jose Antonio Vargas is the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, reporter who was on the reporting team at the Washington Post that won the prize for its work on the Virginia Tech shootings. In the summer of 2011, in the New York Times Magazine, he came out as an undocumented person. Uh, and since then has started the organization Define American to help change the conversation about immigration in the United States. Let's watch a little clip of Jose Antonio Vargas at work. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. You can never whip these boys if you don't keep you and them separate. I found that out in Birmingham. You've got to keep the white and the black separate. The entire problem is the fact we haven't sat down at each other's table. Paco and his family, they spent the night at my house. I spent the night at their house. I've eaten at their table. They've eaten at my table. It's a, a friendship deal and, and uh, he works for, with me also. I'd rather say he works with me yeah. than, than yeah. for me. The idea that that if I've got Paco in a vehicle with me, then, then I'm, I'm liable also and, and I can be arrested. Well, that, that's telling me who my friend, the state of Alabama, telling me who my friends can be. I, that, that's what buffaloes me. I tell his grandkids that they're my nietos, my grandchildren. Right there, guys. They're, to me, they're, they're sort of like another set of grandchildren. When they leave, I'll, they're like family. I'll have, I'll have tears in my eyes if they're not running down my cheeks. Uh, there's no doubt about it. This is not the kind of America I want, not the kind of Alabama I want. Yeah. Uh, no, no way. We're, we're going backwards instead of forward. All right. Thank you. Uh, while we continue, can one of the ARC staff please find Jonathan and get my phone from him? Thank you. I see him in the back. He's bringing me my phone, I hope. All right, uh, next we have Nagin Farsad. Nagin was named one of the funniest uh, one of the 50 funniest women in the world, presumably, which is uh, really uh, elite, by the Huffington Post. She has written for and appeared on Comedy Central, MTV, the Independent Film Channel, and many others. She is hilarious. She has a potty mouth, which makes me a fan of hers. And um, she is the producer of the documentary film, the, the, uh, really the tour documentary, The Muslims Are Coming. And we're going to watch the trailer for the film right now. Make no mistake about it, Islam is a violent religion. Is there a Muslim problem? Look what's happening. We are dealing with a culture that is in its medieval era. These are young, angry terrorists who want to kill you, and they want to kill me, and you know it. Stop with the PC crap. Can I invite you to a stand-up comedy show? It's absolutely free. It's tonight at 8 o'clock. It's called The Muslims Are Coming. There's a bunch of Muslims on stage, but they're hilarious. <laughs> claims responsibility for things they could have never done. Did you know the eclipse? We did it for Allah. The goal of the tour is to go out to middle America using comedy, reaching out to people beyond our community. 
and give America this big Muslim hug. <laughs> Come on, America, bring it in. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that feels good. <laughs> People don't notice minorities usually until either uh, one of them has a hit song or does something horrible. Well, how do you feel about 9-11? Today is the day a live Muslim is here to answer your questions. Why doesn't the Muslim community be more proactive in denouncing terrorism? Why do I have to prove to you that I'm not dangerous? If you're constantly trying to prove that you're the model minority, it's exhausting. Oh, wait, we have unemployment? What about those Muslims? Having trouble creating jobs? What about those fucking Muslims? I'm standing in the middle of the dance floor, and I see this dude checking me out. And so I did what any good Muslim girl would do, and I allowed him to grind up on me right here. <laughs> I would much rather the edgy Muslim who says vagina is the one that we're more associated with than the edgy Muslim who kills people. The Mormons asked me if I wanted to be a missionary when I turned 19, and I said, look, to an Arab, a mission's a whole different deal. <laughs> I don't know, like, if Muslims watch this documentary, if they'll consider these comics proper representations of Islam. I wish I had more support from some subsects of the Muslim community, and I don't. I wish these folks the best. They may well be setting themselves up to be killed. Comedy has a huge role to play for saying things that the mainstream media will not say. Any dummy can enjoy a nice stand-up show. What a great moment for Muslims. The eyes are upon you now. You have to appeal to what is un-American about Islamophobia. You have to make an appeal based on American values. Ah, the casing flew back into my cleavage. Hey, we work with you. We're your neighbors. We're nice. We make pie. We hate gays, but uh, outside of that, we're just nice normies. Muslims! Muslims, you know they are a coming. We just barely just let the gays in recently. The fact that the Muslims are coming in now, things are getting a little crowded in the green room, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know they want to. Great. Lowless Eric Eli is a writer and a documentary filmmaker. He writes about food and music and most recently has been a writer on the HBO show Treme. How many of you have been watching that show? Is it awesome or what? Uh, we're going to watch a clip now from his documentary Faubourg Treme. What you had here was constant contact between free and enslaved people, and what you had here was revolution and rebellion and agitation against slavery that was as strong, if not stronger, in the free black community as it was in the enslaved black community. Louisiana has the distinction of having the largest slave revolt in the history of America, 500 by their own estimation, by the estimation of the newspapers at the time, 500 enslaved Africans broke free off the plantations and were marching on New Orleans. What happened with that revolt? That revolt eventually was put down by the military. I mean, it became an all-out battle. And the leaders of the revolt were executed, some of them right here in Congo Square. Heads cut off, put on pikes and everything else like that to try and discourage any further activity. It was no accident that rebellious slaves were executed here. Congo Square was and is the heart of Faberg Treme and all of black New Orleans. Here, generations of African Americans played music, danced, and sold goods at the market. In Congo Square, African culture helped give birth to jazz, and together they spilled out onto the streets of Treme. We call this the second line, after the line of dancers that follows the band. New Orleans breathes Africa. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you.
Jeff Chang is the person that I have known the longest on this panel since we were like three. Uh, not really, just 20. Um, Jeff Chang is the executive director of the Institute for Diversity in the Arts at Stanford University. He is also an organizer with Culture Strike, which uh, is an effort to bring artists together around immigration issues, particularly in Arizona and the Southwest. He is the author of Can't Stop, Won't Stop, the definitive history of the hip hop generation and also the author of the upcoming book, Who We Be, uh, Who We Be, which you should buy when it comes out, which is gonna be when? Next year. Next year, okay, that's a, that's a long time. <laughs> You'll know when, when to pre-order it. So let's watch a clip of Jeff's. And Jeff, over the last four years, you've written a number of articles and you've spoken to this resurgence of a culture war. Um, and maybe I can start off with you because you said in order to move things politically you're going to have to do things on a cultural tip and you made the assertion that many people on the left, at least in the power establishment of the left, has not really embraced that while the right is running roughshod on the culture wars and maybe you can, maybe you can start and you can set the tone and how you frame that. Well, you know, we, I think all of us here <coughs> at this table and there's uh, a lot of folks out in your audience and that kind of thing would agree with the idea that cultural change precedes political change. And, you know, there's all kinds of examples that we could talk about. You talk about Jackie Robinson, you know, coming out in Dodger Blue um, uh, on the field seven years before the Brown versus Board of Education decision. You could talk about Ellen DeGeneres coming out on TV uh, all these years before, you know, Don't Ask, Don't Tell gets repealed. There's just numerous examples. Hip hop in a lot of ways, I think we'd all agree, made it possible for us to imagine that there could be a black president. Right. I mean, in 2000, uh, they did a poll of young people, and something like 60% of students of color couldn't even imagine there being a black president. Um, but eight years later, they were the ones that helped elect uh, Barack Obama. Um, so, you know, we think that, that if you change the culture, then you have a shot at changing the politics, that politics is sort of the last domino, so to speak. Right. Thank you. All right, so we have just a tiny bit more than an hour, really about an hour. So we're going to go really quickly, rapid fire. Uh, we got to get Nagin and um, Jose onto various kinds of transportation. So I'm going to start with the uh, question that is the title of the plenary. So in this clip, Jeff asserts that cultural change precedes political change. You know, that's a very specific kind of sequencing that he is suggesting. And I just want to hear from each of you, uh, you know, your broad strokes notion about the relationship between culture and politics. Do you think that they're sequential? Uh, do you think that there's, do you, would, might you ever disagree with Jeff and say, oh, well, actually here in X example, it, the political change came first and it was really critical. Uh, let's just, let's just hear your answer to the or does it part. And why don't we actually not start with Jeff and can we start with you, Jose? Yeah. Um, right. Yes, I agree that culture, um, the cultural change happens for political change. Um, and let me just, but when we talk about culture, I want to kind of unpack a little bit what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, as, as somebody who's been a journalist for like a decade, and I'm actually working on my second documentary, um, I think of culture as storytelling. I mean, to me, that's a kind of at the heart of culture. Um, and the fact that we have now new technologies, I mean, I remember when Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, kind of like 2005 to 2007, when I was a reporter at the Washington Post, I was drawn to it initially because, you know, having worked in newsrooms my whole life, newsrooms that never reflected the diversity of the people that they cover. I mean, we have a situation right now in which the New York Times finally has a woman editor and it's like, it's like denial has like parted. <laughs> what are they going to do when they get a Puerto Rican one? <laughs> you know, it's uh -huh. like, um, to me, the, the, the great thing about, you know, Twitter or YouTube and Facebook is it allows people to tell their own stories, right? 
And I mean, especially for us, kind of in, in the undocumented movement and also in the gay movement or any other movement that has always been considered as the other in America, I think we now are all telling our own stories. We are now in charge. We are now playing offense. And how we do that, how we make sure that we're empowering not just our own communities, but how we bridge the gap and preach beyond the choir, to me, I mean, for me, as somebody who's, you know, I've been working on this film now for two years before I came out. Came out. <laughs> came out for the second for time. For the second time. <laughs> right. And I'm like totally done coming out. Um, <laughs> really? Totally sure? Done. Totally done. <laughs> Nothing more to say. Um, but <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's been fascinating to me watching how the very notion of whom we define as minorities you know, as somebody who's Filipino with a name like Jose, who's gay, who's undocumented, and who majored in black studies in college, like, I fit in a lot of minority boxes. But I'm actually not a minority. I think this election, in some ways, has, rede has redefined for us what a multi-ethnic majority America looks like. And I, I would like to declare independence <laughs> from from being called, quote unquote, a minority. I'm a majority of one. <laughs> and I think culturally, I think that's something that it's funny because even you see that in, in all the work here, I think that's the subtext, you know? Um, and it's gonna be fascinating to see how that evolves, mm -hmm. I think in the next few years. Great, thank you. Lilis, let's go to you next. I was all prepared to take the opposite position and to say that um, <laughs> my brother was wrong. And then I thought about it. And what's striking to me about political change is that part of what happens is for you to, to decide to come out, for you to decide to, to take a stand, there has to be a feeling that there's the possibility of the community reacting, that there's enough feeling, even though people may not necessarily have already put their bodies on the line in this way, you do feel that the society is ready for a kind of change. A big part of that lesson for me was in reading part in the, Parting the Waters and checking out the ministers who preceded Dr. King in Alabama and therefore made it conceivable that they might be successful. Mm -hmm. Similarly, a big part of the discovery for me in the making of our film was this idea that the Civil Rights Movement was taking place in New Orleans in the 1890s when there were still black folks in the legislature at a time when lynchings were at an all-time high. Now, because national cultural change had not happened to such an extent as to enable that movement to become national, even regional, the country did not do Brown versus Board, they did Plessy versus Ferguson instead. Mm -hmm. But um, I think in order for the political change to take place, either the political leadership or even the leaders themselves have to, um, have to believe that there exists in society a will for this change. Also, if you think about the word avant-garde and what that means in military terms, avant -garde. what usually happens to avant-garde is they get killed. They go out and they say, okay, this is where we should fight the battle, this is where we should go. They come back, or if they come back at all. But the people who are actually are able to take advantage of that information and do something with it are the folks who have the successful movements. Yeah. So in some ways, uh, you guys are starting to talk about the... Um, the pre-movement periods, right? So we're really accustomed in our study of history to focus in on those periods where dramatic things happen, where there's spontaneous growing action and replication of action, the sit-ins get replicated everywhere. But before that happens, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. The community has to get consolidated, it has to develop an identity, um, and it has to do some things together. So there's we could, you know, one way of thinking about this might be as the pre-movement periods. Nagin, what, what do you want to say about this? Um, well, I, I said this um, in a panel earlier, so apologies for not being able to develop two different thoughts. Um, but uh, I, uh, that, I said earlier that, like, that Lenny Bruce went on stage um, and, and he was a popular comedian. He used um, his popularity to be able to say cock on stage. And that means that now like I can say cock on stage and that's like the gift that he gave me and I utilize it freely like a lot. Cock, <laughs> cock, cock. And, um, 
And that was like a, I'm sorry, she did say I was a potty mouth, so you've been uh, warned. Lord. And um, But but that is the kind of um, cultural change that, that you know, that, that, um, that happens before. But I think what's interesting about the question is almost, in a lot of these circumstances, the question is like, um, it it doesn't <clears throat> matter what the political like some of the, the with the stuff I do I'm I'm not like there's not a law that I want enacted that says you know don't think of Muslims as shitty people like that's not a reasonable law to expect me to get enacted right so I don't even give a I don't care uh, I was gonna say I don't give a shit I don't know why I didn't just say that <laughs> I don't ki- so I, so in some senses like I don't I don't I'm not even thinking I don't care what the, the political outcome is of the of the stuff that I do um I care about oh I almost only care about the social outcome of what I do I only care about like my goal right now is to replace the stereotype that Muslims are terrorists with the stereotype that Muslims are fucking hilarious right <laughs> that's my goal and so, and there's, and so there's no, uh, and and so that which makes the question, um, in, in you know, not n- directly related, you know, related sometimes. So you couldn't possibly be suggesting that uh, cultural oh, activity man. might have some inherent value beyond the political. I mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, we have your clip, but you get the last word on this question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't even know where to start actually because <laughs> it kind of summed up everything that I was going to say. But um, but I guess I have <laughs> to say something anyways. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so th- this book that I'm working on is called Who We Be: The Colorization of America, and it started out the way I pitched it was as a book uh, about the rise and the fall of the multiculturalism arts movement. And I went to my editor with it, and she's like. Multiculturalism's got no swag. Who cares about that anymore? And what it turned out was, was that the book ended up being about the persistence of the culture wars, um, why the culture wars never went away. And so I think like um, one of the things that that was was really interesting to me was that the multiculturalism arts movement. It's a, it was a short-lived movement, right? It's, it's really like dating between the 70s and then it sort of um, breaks in the early 90s and by 93, 94, it's, it's the, the wave kind of comes back out, right? Um, so it's short compared to say hip-hop, right? As an arts movement. But the notion was, was after you get the laws changed, after you have de jure segregation uh, removed, like how are we actually gonna live together? Right? And so the culture wars that continue to today are about still these questions. How are we going to live together? And I think that all of the questions that we've been asking this weekend um, come to that. We have a view of how people should live together. Um, we believe in integration. We believe in empowerment. We believe uh, in a majority of all, right? Um, and. And I think that that's in opposition to this this notion uh, that was defeated in the last election, that uh, that you know it ought to be an assimilationist type of process, that the, it ought to be about hierarchies, racial hierarchies, about maintaining these racial hierarchies that date back hundreds of years. Um, and so I think that in that sense we have to fight in the culture. Uh, we don't have any choice. You know, it's. Culture is where everybody's at pretty much all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and political change, uh, we think of in terms of events like a judicial decision, like an election, um, and these kinds of things. Uh, but, but what's all the stuff that's happening outside of that? Before that, after that, uh, in the lead up to it, in the middle, all around that, it's, it's happening in the culture. And I think that that's where we need to seriously think about playing and playing hard. Great. Uh, So let me ask you all, you know, organizers and activists, people who are trying to push policy, we tend to be, well, we, maybe I shouldn't say we, they, um, tend to be um, really transactional 
about the, uh, the cultural engagement that our organizations do or have. You know, we, we just want another way to get out the message that we developed, uh, you know, in the, in the context of making political change. And that can, I, I'd love for each of you to talk about what kind of advice you would give to organizers who have some inkling that we need other ways to communicate with people, you know, beyond the, you know, straightforward political speech or the, the um, broadside, the uh, mobilization email. What, what would you say to people who want to be culturally engaged but who tend to um, just end up producing a flyer with their existing slogan in a different font than it had <laughs> last week? <laughs> Can we start with Nagin? Oh, actually, Lois looked ready, so you raised your mic, you know I'm going to call on you. How deceptive these looks can be. Yeah. <laughs> um, my suggestion would be that you listen and try to get some sense of how people are already expressing themselves. Evaluate to what extent your own vision, your own message is parallel to what people are already saying, what they're already doing. There are a couple of instances in the context of New Orleans culture mm -hmm. that were especially powerful for me in the days following the levee failures. Uh, it's a story that I have told many times before, so perhaps some of you have heard it. But years ago, a friend of mine was visiting from South Africa, and he saw a second line parade, like the one that my clip ended with. Mm -hmm. And, um, no, I'm sorry, he saw a protest in the city and asked me, where was the dancing? Because in the South African context, there's a toy, toy dancing that accompanies a lot of the political protest. And so he's like, how are these people, these black people protesting in the absence of this sort of dance? I had no answer. After the levee failures, when people were being told that they could not return to their homes, suddenly the second line parades, which I had never seen as overtly political, became political, became a statement about for people about how badly they wanted to return. And among other things, the signs they held were the signs, the street signs, from the neighborhoods that had been destroyed and that were most likely not to be allowed to return. So in that sense, an expression that had already been a part of the culture had been transformed because it had a purpose at that point, was useful at that point. Similarly, one of the great tragedies of American culture, American regional culture, I think, is the fact that we've lost our regional foods and we've lost our regional music. Mm -hmm. The week after Hurricane Katrina was a Monday, the storm hit on a Monday, and I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and Baton Rouge is about as far from New Orleans as the North Pole is from the South Pole. But in New Orleans, every Monday, the tradition is to eat red beans and rice. And so those of us who are exiled in Baton Rouge gathered that evening and had a meal of red beans and rice. And in that sense, affirmed our belief in our city, despite what the national media was saying about the inadvisability of rebuilding this place. In so simple an act as choosing a menu, we were able to make a statement about our own patriotism and our own determination to rebuild. Mm. And I can imagine that in various other kinds of contexts. When you find whatever the sacramental food of your movement or your people or your group would be, whatever music speaks to you in a certain kind of way, imagine what it would be like to hear your national anthem here in the middle of France, in the middle of Nigeria, in the middle of the Philippines, whatever, and they play the Star Spangled Banner. There's an aspect of that that will touch you in a way that a sign proclaiming your political position wouldn't be able to do. So my advice is to look for those kinds of expressions that already exist and try to figure out how you can appropriate them in a way that be most consistent with your own aims. Right. Thanks. <laughs> Nagin. Um, that's like a really tough question. And, Sorry. and I think it's a really tough question because you know what's hard? Like the internet. The internet is so difficult um, because the because you can't. Here's I'm like a young lady, right? I've got like a Twitter account at Nagin Farsad. Follow me. And, <laughs> I, and and I find the internet daunting. So never mind if you're an organization, you actually have a message that you want to push out. 
um, and you're maybe not as well uh, versed in the internet and and suddenly you have to make a flyer except for flyers aren't you know pieces of paper anymore you know what I mean they're digital and they you, you have to put a drop shadow on it and it's like what is that and oh my god and so I, I can see that um, that like that you know the idea of like communicating like in this um, in this new space is really difficult um, and I and I see like I work a lot with like um, I've worked a lot with like AFL CIO uh, local statewide um, chapters and uh, and I see these people who are like um, older and just like barely like able to use their smartphone and they are just trying uh, to figure it out and I think that the, the one thing that I found most heartwarming about um, these people who are dealing with the, with you know advocacy is um, is their willingness to say I don't actually know how the internet works that's one thing that you can do as a leader of an organization is like admit to yourself and your staff that you don't know what the fuck is going on with the internet and and then to, to allow you know, and to, and, and to bring in these like younger people who might know, and not even yet, they don't have to be young, but just that like, that they're, they're people that actually do know uh, how to communicate on the internet. And that's, I think probably, I think the biggest challenge is, is just admitting that we're in a different world order. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and you know, and you, you should use email instead of type a memo or whatever. Uh, that's like the first, and, and I think I, I see that a lot, um, you know, with organizations I've worked with, and uh, and, I, and that's, I think, my biggest um, piece mm -hmm. of advice. Great, thanks. I remember when I first saw the term social media in like a conference, this was like in 2005 in DC, and I remember thinking like, man, that's such a bad term. Like, I don't think social media, it really, I mean, all it really is is the me in media. Like that's what social media is. There is a me in media, right? And how that is again like realigning the way we, not only the way we consume media, but who's producing media and who's watching, right? So that conversation. But back to your original question. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot about, by the way, my favorite magazine is Fast Company. I don't know if you read Fast Company. It's a really interesting magazine. And they had a great article a couple of months ago about, about narrative as branding about how brands really need to think about their narratives. And since I am like, I'm, you know, I guess my life, my professional life has always been about narrative. The first question I always ask is, who's my audience? Who's, the, who's my audience? What's the message? And what's the space I'm creating? It's so funny because whenever I talk about immigration, I'm doing a lot of the talks that I'm trying to do in places like Alabama. I just got back from Birmingham two weeks ago, I was there for a week. And I did like a symposium at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. And people, like remember I gave this little talk thing with all these students, mostly white, maybe about 200 kids. They expect me to like, you know, talk about Im immigrant rights, and I do. But usually I begin with, you remember, you know, back in 1896 to 1956 when 12 million undocumented people from Europe crossed the border called the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> and then landed on Ellis Island with no papers. And some of the students were like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, wait, you're revising history. I'm like, no, 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 I'm just trying to give you context, <laughs> right? And you guys, one out of three of you are sitting in here because somebody without papers crossed the border called the Atlantic Ocean and landed on Ellis Island. I mean, that's just the context. So here we are, nearly 60 years later, talking again about another 12 million people. Is it because we look different and we have different food and we, I don't know, like what is this shit really about? And then turn the table around, the illegal that you call me is the illegal you don't understand. Mm -hmm. Right? And. <clears throat> A lot of my work, I mean, at least in terms of narrative, so I'm working on this documentary now on immigration, and my next documentary is actually gonna be on whiteness, is really exploring what that means. Um, you know, in many ways, I think, you know, I remember coming to America when I was 12 from the Philippines and being really shocked because, you know, we learned to speak English in the Philippines by listening to like Whitney Houston and Michael Jackson songs. <laughs> and I never knew that they were black because like, we just thought they were Americans. And then I get to America, and like, oh, they're black. And I'm like, wait up, so did white people, like who, 
I feel like this country invented white as much as it invented black, <laughs> right? And now, and now, and now, that history is cracking open, now that nearly 50% of kids under the age of 18 in America are not white, we gotta start redefining this shit or else we're gonna be in real serious trouble. Like one last little comment I wanna make about Alabama. So here I am talking about Latin people and Asian people, you know, and I'm gay and all that stuff. And this young woman, after my talk, comes up to me, white You're woman, Mike. and she was like shaking. I'm like, why is she shaking? <laughs> and she goes, um, I'm in a sorority, and it's a really big deal here to be in a sorority, and um, they won't, the sorority sisters won't let in this girl because she's half black. Like, how do I talk to them about this? Like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna get kicked out of the sorority because, you know, it's really important to me, and, but I know that it's wrong, and here I am talking to them about, like, an Asian guy named Jose who's gay, and there's this young woman who's talking to me about how they won't let this girl in because she's half black. I'm in fucking Birmingham. 50 years after that segregation now, it's like post-racial Obama America, mm -hmm. bullshit. Sorry, I'm like cutting, cussing. Now you're Nagin. Right next okay. to her. But you know what I'm talking about? Like that's what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important, I think, to really start connecting these dots, which is why it's so, I gotta tell you, it is so heartening to me to be in a place like Alabama and seeing so many African-American civil rights warriors who stand alongside brown people, you know, and saying, I mean, that, that's how we have change happen. You know, we had one African-American judge, UW Clement, tell me on the record that because of HB 56, the Hispanic man is the new Negro in the South. And I'm like, sir, can I get your phone number? I emailed this phone number to every producer I know on CNN and MSNBC, MSNBC and Fox. I mean, please, when you want someone to talk about immigration, can you call this federal judge? <coughs> it, it is so much, now that immigration reform is gonna happen next year, we need so many of our white and black allies to really step up and say that this is also about you, right? Like, that to me, by the way, culturally, is where we need to be. Right. And I hope you can help us out. Thank you. Um, before Jeff goes, I, we do want to take some questions from the audience. We're going to use our little, you know, write it down, um, hand it to Melinda system, and she'll do some sorting and give them to me. So we're going to keep going until I start to get audience questions, and then I'll start asking the audience questions. All right. So, Jeff. I, I feel like we moved for the original question. Should do we do? Yeah. Uh, go wherever you, uh, you, do you want well, me to I, yeah, I just wanted to, the, so maybe if I can take a little digression here. Yeah. I just want to kind of maybe put go a word back into everybody's vocabulary. Um, by the way, I don't think that culture trumps politics, and I'm actually, I would like us to remove the word Trump from our vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> if that's good. Is that good, everybody? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, but to insert in place of that, uh, these two words that used to be really, really big, uh, cultural equity. Because we haven't talked about cultural equity for a very long time. We talked about a lot of issues, but we seem to have lost track of, of this question of cultural equity. And I think that in a lot of ways, folks who used it in the 70s, 80s, and the 90s were talking about questions of access. So access to the tools of, of creativity um, and access to the tools in that sense of transformation, mm -hmm. right? And then also access uh, for artists to be able to get their work out there. So the other issue was representation, of course, and this led to the culture wars, right? Questions of lack of representation um, and questions of misrepresentation. And I think we're in a different era now, right? We've learned, obviously, that more representation isn't necessarily better representation. Right. Um, and I think that more than ever, uh, we're all aware of how, uh, you know, we have to challenge content. Uh, we have to challenge, you know, the faces uh, of this. We were just talking actually at the table earlier um, at lunch, right? Loris and uh, a wonderful uh, singer-songwriter, uh, Aaron McCune. Um, did I get your, I, I probably missed, anyway. And, and Rachel, a partner, um, we were talking about, for instance, the notion of the black president. Uh -huh. You all might remember the show 24 that came out, right? 24 was written actually by a very right-wing uh, writer, director, producer. Um, and, but the president was black, 
right? Dennis Hastert. And this happened in the context of the war on terrorism. So it was sort of this circling of the wagons of, here's an image of a black president during a, a, a global war on terror that we're trying to get everybody mm -hmm. united around. Like, we, we make these racial advances during wartime. And it's very related uh, that we would have this particular character being shown at the same time that Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice are the new faces of American militarism, right? Mm -hmm. um, so all representation isn't necessarily good representation. We all know that. Um, but if we are able to come back with this notion of cultural equity uh, tied into transformation, right? Individual transformation. So the basic level of being able to make sure that kids have access to the tools of creativity. Um, and yeah, please clap. <laughs> I want everybody to be on, into this. And, and the tools of transformation uh, community-wide, nationally, globally, um, if we can talk about cultural equity in that context for this new decade, I think that we'll be able to move a, a lot further closer to the kind of agenda that we all want to push around this sort of new integrationist um, ideal and platform. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so the original question was what advice do you have for activists and organizers who uh, want to get into, who want to uh, do better on the cultural tip as well? Did you want to say something? You're okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to ask you. I want to know what what you consume, what you like to uh, read and watch and listen to. You know, who's your favorite novelist? Uh, what's your favorite TV show? Wherever Tremay. you want to go with that, <laughs> Treme. Certainly my favorite at the moment. Yes. Flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Great. I'm, I'm watching a lot of Fox News. You are? This. Yeah. For entertainment I, purposes? I actually made a decision a couple of months ago that I'm gonna, not going to do as much MSNBC and CNN, that I uh -huh. usually just do more Fox. Yep. So I've done O'Reilly maybe like seven times now. Um, and not because I care about O'Reilly, but I care about O'Reilly's audience. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm really doing a lot of KKK reading. <laughs> just a lot of like... Because, you know, I get a lot of hate mail, and so I usually follow them where they come from. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing. Right. A lot of masochistic stuff, I guess. Interesting. <laughs> Tells us a lot about you, Jose. Lolas. <laughs> um, in terms of music, I'm in my Brazilian period. Uh -huh. So, Monica Salmaso, Chigana Santana, um, uh, Chico Cesar. Uh, and I've been kind of studying TV, so watching a whole lot of TV, sometimes just a couple episodes. There's a show on AMC called The Killing, which is great. Huh. Um, and Homeland, obviously. Um, so. Okay, we have some Homeland fans here. Jeff, Nagin? Uh, well, so we're, like, I watch some garbage. You know what I mean? Like, I'm Yeah, tell us what it is. I don't watch Name names. <laughs> um, and like, stations. Well, because, and then the reason I watch garbage, like, The Soup, or, like, I've watched an episode of every of the j really shitty um, Housewives shows. <laughs> um, I, I mean, you know, have I watched Honey Boo Boo? Yes, I have. Oh. Um, I have and, and, and I'll tell you the reason why, and, and I also watched Breaking Bad and Mad Men and all the requisite, like, smarty pants things. Um, and, and I also, like, I read, guys. Okay, there's a New Yorker in my bag, so uh, yeah, all right, all right. don't look at me like that. But, we want proof. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think it's really important, actually, to, like, see what the garbage is. Um, because you have to be able to communicate in the like universal language of garbage yep, 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 yep. and it's really so you have to know right like if you're a writer if you're an artist or whatever you just have to know what people are consuming so you can um, uh, take whatever you can take from it and make it better okay Ratchet by the time culture. Jeff has told us I need some questions <laughs> I don't know who's got my questions from the audience, but I want them. Oh, they're way in the back of the room. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll do some. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, shout out Erin again. Uh, on, on Monday on NPR, she's going to be having a song that's going to be debuted um, about immigration. And it's part of um, a trip that we all took to Tucson uh, and then also to Nogales, to the border. Um, and that song is going to be coming out. So everybody check out NPR Music on Monday uh, for Aaron's amazing music. Um, I've also been listening to a lot of Kendrick Lamar, actually, of late. 
because I feel like you know there's also this there's also a new uh, generation uh, of folks uh, that are coming up and there's been a turn I think there's sort of a new um, sort of post hip hop aesthetic that I think is actually beginning to emerge in a lot of ways and it's a lot of a critique of the excesses of hip hop um, particularly around um, its sexism and violence and so uh, I'm really excited about that but I also wanted to give a huge shout out to all of the undocumented artists here up in the house um, and the folks who've been working around those issues um, and to also give a shout out to Jose because I just want to say like if, if anybody's kind of on the fence about you know cultural change and the importance of story I, I just want to say like I feel like the election was won because of the undocumented activists and Jose in a lot of ways because everybody's going to say okay everybody to all the Latinos turned out okay um, but the issue of immigration would not have been on the table had there not been this whole spring and summer of protests, of art, of exhibition, of folks marching on Washington, mm -hmm. of folks like doing all kinds of amazing events in all these different types of cities, of folks sitting in, um, in, in Obama's campaign offices, of folks getting arrested by trying to, you know, sit in at ICE centers. If none, if none of that had happened, and then if Jose hadn't had this cover, on the time of on Time magazine, then that issue would not have been rising to the forefront for Obama. And so, you know, we we have a direct example here of what happens when we put the pressure on. Things can happen, you know? And this is an example of not the policy folks getting together in a small room somewhere and saying, you know, this is what it's all got to look like and then we're going to take it out to the world. This is something that bubbled up from the grassroots, um, proliferated all over the place, created these memes, uh, created this excitement around the country, and then actually changed shit, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think that that's something that we should just recognize today as well. Yeah, right on. Can I, can I add something to that? Sure. Um, Jeff, that was very kind. Uh, I, um, and I want to make sure, because, you know, I mean, I, it's very important to acknowledge the fact that the undocumented movement has been happening, especially amongst young people, since at least 2005, if not earlier. You know? Um, I mean, in some ways, I came at this very late. Um, and if it wasn't because of, you know, activists like Julio Salgado, by the way, if you don't know his work, you got to really check it out. See in the Julio house? Salgado. Julio, where are you, man? Okay, he's not here right now. Yeah, he might, but he's out he might have had to go. People like Perna Lal, um, who's really amazing, um, who does a lot of work within gay rights and immigrant rights and all that. Like, I basically just like plopped myself completely unannounced <laughs> and showed up. And the very question I had to ask myself, and Jeff and I talk a lot about this because Jeff has been an incredible mentor in this regard, is, you know, I'm not an organizer. I'm not a leader. I'm not a community activist. I'm not, that's not what I do and that's not who I am and that's not my lane. Mm -hmm. And from the very beginning, I, I remember when I quote unquote came out in the New York Times, my next thing is how do we get on the cover of Time Magazine? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we get on the cover of People Magazine? Like my next thing right now is how do we get all of the allies that help out people like me? If it wasn't for a, my high school principal or my editor at the Washington Post who lied for me for five years, I would not have stayed at the Washington Post and covered a presidential campaign and won a Pulitzer. How many other editors are out there lying and protecting their coworkers, maybe in a restaurant, at an engineering, whatever, mm -hmm. right? Like creating those spaces and making sure, and this is why I really believe, you know, I, I love that phrase, by the way, cultural equity. You're right. Jeff, we haven't heard too much about it, but to me, creating kind of the cultural space in which to be undocumented now, I think has like hit the mainstream. People understand what the DREAM Act is, but now how do we make sure that it's not just about the DREAM Act? Because the DREAM Act, as we know, is just one slice mm -hmm. of the pie. Right. It's the sexy thing. You know, it's the kids who go to college and speak English well. You know, like what do we do with most of the people Thank who you. may not? So uh, to me, that's kind of the importance of not just, uh, not just realizing the role that culture plays, but making sure that we're really reaching various audiences and thinking as mainstream as we possibly can be. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, many questions. We're, we have about 25 minutes to go. 
and um, so we've been doing four responses to each question we don't have to if you don't feel like you have something interesting to say you can feel free to pass it along um, but I do want to deal with the question of uh, stories and storytelling and what effect you think uh, stories have Jose you spoke about this a little bit earlier so maybe we'll focus on the um, the three people to your right um, but and I'd love Nagin or anyone to talk about um, the role of humor in that because it can it can, people can be very attracted to it and also not and really fear it so when you're telling a story why would you uh, you know in the context of making change making social change Lois you want to start I know you don't want to start but I also know you can the great thing about story uh, as opposed to um, just having a speech a totally non-fiction speech the great thing about story is it brings the reader or the listener along with the person telling the story. So suddenly your story becomes my story in a way that your issues may not be my issues. That at the point when I can see you as human and see resonance between your life or the life of your character and my own, then there's an extent to which there's a, a shared community and it is possible then to talk about the kind of political implications of story. And in terms of humor, the same kind of thing. We can establish that we, like in the, the panel right before this one, they were talking about um, humor being a two-way street in the sense that a joke is funny if the audience laughs. And if the audience don't laugh, it's not a joke. Uh -huh. Well, if we agree that this is funny, then we've already established a kind of common ground. We've already made a deal here. We've already established that there's some commonality on which other things may be based. Mm -hmm. The other problem is that the assumption is always, man, I remember one time, I was in the Church of the Black Medina in Atlanta, right? Back when I was trying to find my religion. And so the minister gets up there, and there's some little kid in the front row, like six or seven years old, who's playing a clown or something, and the minister says, you know, uh, John, this is too serious. Boy, you can't be sitting there playing. This is serious. You know, the white man trying to do this. And I'm like, the kid is six years old. <laughs> Ain't nothing that serious. <laughs> but when, when folks got this sort of sense that, you know, the revolution gonna happen tomorrow at noon, y'all better go home and get ready. Well, not really. <laughs> you know, so um, not really. we have a reputation for not taking ourselves so seriously. I mean, I'm sorry, for taking ourselves too seriously. I fear that we have earned that and should seek to lose it. Well said, thank you. Nagin? Um, well, there, there, like, First of all, you know when you're like being held hostage um, and in the situation no. where we normally find ourselves, someone with a gun or something, um, you're like supposed to talk about your family, you're like supposed to be like, my name is whatever and I've got my sister's name is whatever, blah, and you're supposed to do that, it's like a tactic, uh, I know because I'm Muslim. <laughs> um, <laughs> kidding guys guys um and uh, we're laughing <laughs> and um and uh and, and and it's because you know they can't they're gonna have a hard time torturing you or whatever if they like can picture you as a person with a family and like feelings and shit like that um and so and and that's i mean and that's why stories are effective <laughs> because of this weird hostage metaphor that i'm drawing um and, and, and you know because you you can really like you can really connect to people. And I think with comedy, I mean, here's the thing, like, if you see someone give a lecture or whatever, um, you may not want to talk to them afterwards because you're like, I get it, buddy. You already put me to sleep in the room. <laughs> I'm going to go, you know, have a beer be to get over what just happened to me in the minutes I'll never get back. But <laughs> if, if you are like... You know, if you if you get to have a good time because of of a talk um, or stand up or story or whatever, and is in the, I'm obviously talking about humor here. Like, if you can have a good time, um, you're gonna. And I, I mean, whenever I do shows or whatever, like when I did shows where the Muslims were coming, people would always come up and talk to me afterwards um, and ask their questions. Is they suddenly felt like they could because comedy is welcoming. It doesn't, it, it doesn't assume that you are not smart because I don't, I don't need to fucking uh, quote Edward Said when I'm doing stand-up. I don't do that, you know what I mean? 
And so there's a language of comedy that's like, I'm not fucking smart. You're not fucking smart. Let's not be smart together. It's okay. You know what I mean? And so I think that's what like humor does. Um, it kind of like it makes it okay for you to ask a question. And that's all. What's all we wanted when we were on tour. Um, and I, and I have to note, um, it helps. You know, if you're just like a friendly person, you know, whatever. If you're dressed like a cartoon, as I normally am, um, the, these kinds of things are make people uh, uh, feel welcome. And so I think um, that's uh, the end. The, all I have to say about that. Great, thank you, um, Jeff. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think. I think Patrice O'Neill had this quote about how when he, you know, Patrice O'Neill is this great, uh, late great um, black comic um, who passed away uh, last year. And there was this quote that was attributed to him where it was like, you know, if, if white audiences come and see me, they have to sit there and listen to me say, oh yeah, you're the devil, motherfucker. And they laugh, you know, and, and I think that that, that, that comment kind of hit me really strong because I was trying to think in, in terms of this book, Who, Who We Be, The Colorization of America. Am I plugging too much? No. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no um, such thing. So I, I was just thinking in terms of, and I, ended, I didn't end up getting to, I actually, uh, I want to do something uh, on this in the future, but uh, it's going to take a while um, because I have to learn a lot more. But anyway, race comedy <laughs> is really fascinating to me because there are only two places I feel like where we're actually able to have this conversation on race that Clinton had like officially begun, <laughs> right? <laughs> Back in 90, right. whatever, five or six, and concluded like a year, yeah, a year later. Um, and uh, before the Monica Lewinsky scandal, he had, he had done that, right? We were supposed to have this, we were, ha we were supposed to have this conversation on race, and now the only places that we have it are in race comedy um, and in scandal. So like Michael Richards, right, Kramer, right, says some crazy shit, and then all of a sudden everybody's piling on for about 12 hours and then he's done. Mm -hmm. He's been like exiled from the island. Um, and whatever conversation we were supposed to have about the meaning of those words, where they come from, what they represent, um, you know, about racial hierarchies, all of this kind of stuff never gets talked about. But in race comedy, that's the only place where folks actually are able to get together, sit there, laugh, maybe even have a conversation, you know, afterwards about it. Um, and so I think that that's, that's, that's really interesting. It says a lot about the state of the race conversation in the U.S. Um, and it says a lot about the power of comedy, I think. Right. Um, we are, I have a lot of really interesting questions here, but we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Uh, but I do want to pull up a couple in particular and whoever feels moved can, can respond. So the first one is from a social studies teacher probably middle school or high school, uh, asking what advice you might give to educators who are trying to give their students uh, more complete or better context for dealing with the ways and for the dealing with these issues, the ways in which race plays out. What advice might you give to teachers uh, uh, about things they could do or resources they could use or approaches they might try? I'm riffing on your question, and I hope that's okay, whoever you are. Teach rap poems. Teach rap poems. All Straight right. up. I'm actually really serious about this. Um, this is a way to actually engage the students right where they're at, and you'll find that students get really, really engaged in it, um, and folks are able to kind of think through really complex issues. They already actually have all of this knowledge. Like we actually assume in most cases that we have to transmit and like kind of pour into their heads all of this stuff. They know all this stuff already. They talk about it all the time. They just don't talk about it in your classroom maybe. <laughs> You know, they, they, they certainly talk about it in the context of the, net, the, the latest Kendrick Lamar album, I could tell you that, mm -hmm. you know, or the latest whatever, whatever um, thing that they've seen on TV in ratchet culture or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, they'll see stuff and they'll be talking about this stuff all the time. And so it becomes sort of a guided conversation. Um, and if it's a guided conversation, then there's the opportunity to be able to move folks um, in a new direction. So engage with the popular culture. Don't be afraid of it, you know? That's what I'd say. Anyone else? All right. Um, there's a question about 
cultural appropriation. This person would like you to speak to the issue of cultural appropriation, particularly in regards to white activists' use of cultural symbols and so on uh, in their work. So uh, the question doesn't include an example, but we could we can certainly think of plenty of examples of cultural appropriation. Who's white enough on this panel to tackle this question? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just totally kidding. I don't know. Um, you know. What's hard about that is how do you draw the line between, well, this is black culture, this is white culture, this is Asian culture, this is Korean, Chinese, Japanese, <laughs> where do you draw these lines? Yeah. And it also is, it gets in that whole thing about at what point the funny joke about race becomes the offensive joke about race. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can, you can talk about that in some generic or some theoretical sense. If we do believe that it is possible to arrive at definitions of America, perhaps, that there is something of a shared culture, and indeed part of our problem is the extent to which we try to pretend that we don't share a culture. If we do indeed share a culture in a broad sense, then are we not appropriating from ourselves? You know, in the context of black folks and culture, a whole lot of problem really breaks down to money. It's right. like, you know, the Beatles and Rolling Stones say straight up, we listen to Howlin' Wolf, we listen to Chuck Berry, we listen to B.B. King, mm -hmm. and Chuck Berry is saying, I ain't making no money. So perhaps if we can get royalties for these cultural appropriations, you know, in advance of reparations, that might solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a, maybe a cultural equity issue, but appropriation uh, as a notion. I mean, I hear Lilith really pressing us against trying to prohibit the replication or the engagement or the, um, the use of cultural things that get produced out of one community by another community. Like, we don't want those kinds of prohibitions, but we do want equity and credit where it's due and money where it's due because uh, money does get made, culture, you know, through cultural products. It's, Nikki. it's like cultural appropriation is a really slippery concept because like Jose, I have a, a graduate degree in African American studies and um, obviously, why wouldn't I? And um, uh, and it's and it's uh, and and that's weird. I mean, but why did I feel like I could do that? You know what I mean? But because I because it made sense because I'm from a smaller group. We don't have a whole thing with a precedent and people in it. You know what I mean? And I wanted to be a part of something. And so was I. You know what I mean? And so that's why I feel like and and I or or you know I'm writing a, a, a musical called The Israeli Palestinian. Conference or romantic comedy. I am. Um, that's right. And and it's neither. I'm neither Arab nor am I Jewish. But this is a story for me, and I feel like I have every right to to write it. Like it's my story. I'm gonna write it. And uh and so that I don't. I feel like I don't know with that. I think it's it's an important perspective. I mean let me just say, by the way, I always get asked why I majored in African American studies. And at San Francisco State, where I went to school, is actually called Black Studies. It was the first university in the country in 1969 to have a college of ethnic studies. Because mm -hmm. so when I got to America in '93, like I learned how to speak American by like watching movies and like this was like the rise of like Lauren Hill, you know, the mm -hmm. dissertation of Lauren Hill, which is like a, you know, this is a black woman, and I'm not a black woman. And there's that one song called Everything is Everything. Yeah. I remember sitting in my room in Mountain View, closeted gay, closeted undocumented. And one of the lyrics is about, you know, again, like, it spoke to me in such a way that I didn't anticipate that it would. And then I started realizing from where she was coming from, I couldn't really, I don't think any American can understand American history without understanding African American history. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, and, and having said that, how do you explain the fact that, as we all know, the attack against, like, Chicano studies, right, in Arizona? Like, these are American history. The fact that our ancestors, you know, the Filipinos have been here since the 17th century and actually the first landed in, New in, in Louisiana. We've been here. So uh, to me, it's a question of 
how do we make sure that we're really connecting these dots and we're not ghettoizing each other? And I actually think we are now at this space where, you know, I can proudly say that, I mean, I wish in college, I, I, I was actually gonna do African American studies and Jewish studies, because there's no Jewish people in the Philippines too. <laughs> but my college counselor was like, you can't do both of those things, just pick one. <laughs> <laughs> he was totally wrong. I should have totally done both of them. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, Jeff, you might want to get in on this, but there's a related question for you. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, hip hop has been instrumental in political rhetoric and social climate. So in shaping those, I imagine. What relevance does that have, does hip hop have with its uh, rhetoric and change in social climate? What relevance does it have to race relations uh, in non-receptive communities? Uh, and under non-receptive, in parentheses, it says white people. So, <laughs> what is the relevance of hip hop in changing social climate among white people? Um, well, first of all, the dominant portion of the market now is is white buyers so I, I actually disagree a little bit with the with the formulation of the question uh -huh. um, because a lot of and, and okay and so there's this there's this amazing documentary that Byron Hurt did several years ago called um, Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes in which there's this crushing scene where he interviews uh, a white guy in an SUV who's shown up for um, a hip hop festival and, uh, and interviews him about why he likes hip hop and then goes cuts from that to interviewing a bunch of aspiring ra uh, rappers who are outside of this convention uh, and doing like the classic sort of the classically hardcore battle rhymes that that uh, you know I'm gonna cut your head off and shoot you 15 times and then I'm gonna flip you around and you know and kick you in the butt it's you know like that kind of stuff right um, and, I mean the kind of stuff that they thought that would get them a contract and then he said wait a minute like I know you guys are all doing this because you you know you think that's what folks want to hear. What about like talking about stuff that really relates to you? And then somebody gets up and kicks a rhyme about uh, not having a job and you know being depressed and all these kind of like real stuff. And he's like, you know, why won't you do that? He's like, nobody's going to listen to me for that. So there's a pr element he's saying implied in these scenes and the juxtaposition of this is that there's a performance aspect going on to all of this, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that only now, in a lot of respects, are we kind of moving uh, in some ways away from that. There's always been that push away from that, but now, like, you know, Kendrick Lamar number two, you know, on the album chart last week, I think that there, there's going to be an interest in seeing where that opening goes, and then that's going to get calcified, and th that's what the market does. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, the question, the larger question is, is what role... Uh, does hip hop have to play in sort of helping us to think about where race relations should be? And I think that we can't rely upon commodified culture to get us where we go um, in everything. Um, and I think that we can have openings and we can make openings, um, but we really need to kind of understand the ecosystem that culture kind of works in and that the structure of capitalism is not necessarily always going to allow for uh, radical stuff to be talked about and moved and when it does it's gonna close ranks and that's real and this is stuff that we've learned over the last 20 years um, and so we need to be looking again you know at questions of cultural equity pushing the system on these kinds of things but we also look, need to be looking again at questions of alternative systems and I think that that's something that it's very hard to imagine for us now, right? There's a, there's a saying that the Occupy movement brought back, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, <laughs> right? And I think that, that it's easier to imagine uh, the end of the world than imagining the end of racism as well. Mm -hmm. And if we kind of put those two together, we're gonna actually be moving in sort of a really interesting direction that we haven't really charted out yet. Mm -hmm. so. Great, thanks. Uh, we are heading toward the wrap up, and so I'm gonna put out, are you clapping because we're done? <laughs> really? Um, okay, but so I'm gonna put out a last question. You can either address the question or give the audience a last uh, word that you uh, feel like they just, um, their lives won't be complete unless they hear that from you. 
So the last question is uh, very practical. Are there, what are the skills around art and culture, production, criticism, uh, relation, that you think this facing race audience should cultivate among themselves? Whether people think of themselves as artists or not, what are the skills or the attitudes or the like ways of being that you think would be good for this particular movement to cultivate within itself? Either answer that or say whatever you want. I think that's, you know, I'm a really great moderator. <laughs> <laughs> At least for the panel. Um, i just say uh, for, for those of us who are, are, are thinking seriously about racial justice, just to consider the, the importance of culture um, and to listen to the artists. I mean, they, I think that in a lot of respects, we haven't necessarily given the artists um, the kind of the kind of dap, the kind of respect, the kind of autonomy actually, there's a certain amount of autonomy that needs to be given to artists um, in order to create. Um, and so, you know, these are, these are, it, I never liked the term cultural worker because it always presumed, I, I always heard the term cultural worker um, in the context of cultural workers follow political leaders, right? And I think that let's reverse that. Let's, let's like think about what happens if culture leads and what happens if artists lead in certain kinds of situations. I'm not saying artists should take over the movement, um, although I'm, sort of, I'm sure there's some artists in here who would like to take over the movement. That's all good. Um, we'll, we'll take care of you in a bit. <laughs> but, you know, I'm saying like, let's, let's like think about what that looks like and let's open that up um, so that we can understand different ways of, of getting to that sense of possibility that art brings, that culture brings. Great. Jose. Um, <laughs> my friends say that I'm like a walking uncomfortable conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that's probably my main message mm -hmm. is if we can be a little bit more of walking uncomfortable conversations ourselves. Um, <clears throat> I actually, you know, I get beat up a lot sometimes on like listservs. I'm not in any of them, <laughs> but I get told that some of my decisions sometimes gets like, you know, hey, why is Vargas talking to Lou Dobbs? You know, or, oh, for example, like, why did I cross a picket line? Or things like that. Um, and again, you know, like, I am now a public person, so it's very weird for me to even, I've spent my entire career writing about other people. And now I've consciously made a choice to like insert myself in it. And the thing that I deal with mostly is how do I make sure that I'm really preaching beyond the choir? That's my number one thing that I cannot emphasize more. Meaning that how do we make sure that we're not just talking to just progressive people all the time? You know, how do we make sure that, you know, the phrase white privilege, which all of us are familiar with here, I don't know. I've been in Kentucky and Alabama and Wisconsin and Ohio and a lot of working class blue collar white people don't know what the hell white privilege is. How do we get white people to talk to other white people about white privilege? I mean, it's so wonderful that we have so many white allies going to conferences like this and being our allies and standing with us. Can you infiltrate Tea Party meetings too? <laughs> Can you go talk to them There's too? There's a charge. I know, I, I'm just saying, I've gone to them. I've crashed like four tea party, tea party meetings. I'm just, how do we make sure that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, as somebody who's never voted, I'm neither a, I'm neither a Republican nor a Democrat, because I've never voted. I grew up in San Francisco. Gay rights and immigrant rights and all these rights are not, they were my neighbors. It wasn't a political party, and progress shouldn't have a party. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that's my main message, is how do we make sure that we're really, you know, not demonizing each other? Um, and I know in my heart, especially when I go to places where I am, like, they think I'm a threat. They think I'm gonna go in there, wrap myself in a Filipino flag, and like, talk Spanish to them. <laughs> and recite the poems of James Baldwin. They're like, they don't know what the hell I'm gonna do. And then they're like so surprised and I'm like, oh yeah, I like the Waffle House. Your pecan pie is great. What the hell do you think I'm going to say? You know, like, right. so yes, please be walking in comfortable conversations Thank um, you. and embrace that. Right. Lolis, can we go to you next and finish up with Nagin? Warming 
up for Nagin. Um, <laughs> it's an honorable position to be are. in. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> say something funny, too. Um, <laughs> what I would say is folks got to remember that artists don't work for y'all. And it's this whole thing where, you know, your art is supposed to, my art ain't supposed to do nothing I don't want it to do. If it's consistent with what you think it's supposed to be, and if it is useful in your movement, that is your business. If I choose to align myself in the way that some of the artists represented here have chosen to do, and to put their talents in the service of these causes, great. But this notion that art is supposed to do something or to follow your aesthetic, because this is the idea that, well, man, I took art class in second grade. I know it's good art, and that's not good art. Your opinion in that regard is irrelevant. And this notion, art has to serve its own function, be its own master. And then we can decide to what extent it is useful for our purpose or to what extent this artist represents um, what we're trying to deal with. When Jeff talks about culture preceding political change, always bear in mind, you might not understand what's happening in the art because you're too far behind. So keep that in mind and don't be Damn. trying to, you know, come, it's like the Soviet vision of art that purposeful art. Well, right. art is its own purpose. Thank you. Negin. Um, <clears throat> thank you guys for warming up for me. Um, <laughs> stupid. Um, no, I, this is, and I feel horrible that I have to say the last thing, but um, the, uh, well, I, I would say two things. One um, is don't be angry. Like, don't ever be angry. You're going to get so many stupid questions. I get hate mail all the time. I get shitty people yelling at me, whatever. And, and, the, and the key, I think, in the movement is don't get angry because that closes people off and we want to bring people into the fold. Um, and anger is like just, it doesn't ever work. I've never seen it work. Um, and then the other uh, thing I would say, and this is also um, something I said uh, earlier today, um, and again, my inability to come up with two things uh, is upsetting, but um, I, my parents, so my, my parents um, w were like weird about Jews forever, and then we had neighbors move in next door who were totally super Jewish. <laughs> and, um, and they came over one day to introduce themselves, and they brought my parents a rum cake. Um, now, a couple of words on this rum cake. Um, it was really delicious. Okay. Now, maybe the rum cake was made with the blood of Christian babies. I don't know. But it was, it was delicious enough that my parents, who had been weird about Jews forever, suddenly started loving the shit out of Jews. <laughs> and suddenly the discourse changed from like, Jews are weird, to like, Jews are really, uh, they have really tight family units, just like Iranians. Just like Iranians, they would say. And all it took, I swear to God, all it took was a fucking rum cake. <laughs> And then, and the last thing I'll say is I, and, then, and, and you know, I don't even need to go to that level to get a story. This guy right here, I used to be homophobic in high school, and now I'm begging for Jose's attention. Why? <laughs> Why? I swear to God, I want to marry you. I really want to marry you. I'm so in love with you. No, I totally am. <laughs> because in college, my freshman year of college, my, my next door uh, neighbor was gay and one night we got wasted together. And then I was like, wait a second, gay people are super fun. And literally overnight, I, I went from, you know, uh, being homophobic to being a fag hag. So, <laughs> so, um, so it's these small gestures have such a huge impact. Bake your rum cakes. Go out and get wasted with people you don't know. And together we'll change the world. Let's give this panel a round.